I'm a mathematician, I'm not a physicist, and most of the physics that I know comes from the math books that I teach out of. I saw this cool proof of Kepler's second law that really just used Newton's second law and his inverse square law, and the rest of it was just a bunch of math. It's like, oh, I know this stuff. And it's become one of my favorite applications of calculus and vectors. So say you got a planet and it's orbiting its star, and pretend the planet's spinning. This isn't my best animation, but they get better. So Kepler noticed, just by going through a ton of observations, that the planet travels faster on its orbit when it's close to the star, and it travels more slowly when it's farther from the star. And this formed the basis of what we now call Kepler's second law. To say it a little bit differently, imagine that the inside of the orbit is like a big pie. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a cut along the line that extends from the star to the planet. Now, if we make a cut at equal times, say every second, then Kepler's second law says that the area of each of the pie pieces is the same value. Before the proof, let's meet two important people. This is Danish astronomer and artisanal mustache enthusiast, Tycho Brahe. He collected most of the observations that Kepler studied to formulate his laws. Here's our guy, Johannes Kepler. He's wearing a collar made out of coffee filters and he's holding a compass just like any normal person. Here's a telescope that Kepler designed in about 1611 and it was the best in the business for a little over 100 years. What do you think Kepler's face would look like if he saw the James Webb telescope? Probably something like this. Speaking of that, when I googled the James Webb Telescope, this interactive model showed up. And you can click on some of the pieces, and it gives you a description. And I just thought this was really cool, because this is probably the closest I'm ever going to get to this incredible telescope in my life. But anyway, let's get to the proof. We're going to assume that we've got a simple system, where it's just the planet that orbits the star. And the star's gravity acts on the planet in accordance with Newton's inverse square law. The first equation that we're going to write down is Newton's second law of motion, which says the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. By the way, bold letters represent vectors. The inverse square law says the magnitude of the force is the gravitational constant times the mass of the two bodies divided by the distance between the two bodies squared. So the force of gravity, that we're calling F, should be parallel to the position vector, R, but it should have the opposite direction of the position vector. Right? Gravity is pulling the planet toward the star. Here I'm using the words radial and position kind of interchangeably, so they both refer to the vector r. And now we can get an expression for the vector f. I'll take a unit vector u has length 1 that points along r, I'll scale it by the magnitude of f, and I'll put a minus sign to turn it around so it has the opposite direction of r. Now substitute ma into the inverse square law. From calculus we know that acceleration is the second derivative of position, we'll use dot notation for derivative. So two dots means second derivative. This equation tells us that the position vector and the acceleration vector are constant multiples of each other. So that means they're parallel. Now, another way to say that they're parallel is that their cross product is the zero vector. This cross product being zero is key to showing that the planet orbits in a plane. In the above video, I go through the details of how flat orbit is equivalent to the cross product of position and velocity being constant. In other words, r cross r dot is always the same vector c. You see that green vector never changes. That's what I need for this video. Let's zoom in on a pie piece from earlier. We're going to show that the instantaneous rate of change in the area over time is constant. In other words, the rate at which the area is increasing is always the same. Okay, what are some of these symbols? Delta t is just supposed to represent some change in time. So earlier, I was saying make a cut in the pie every second. In that case, delta t is one second. Then delta a is going to be the change in the area over delta t units of time. And so that would be the difference. How much area do I have when delta t seconds have gone by minus how much area did I start with? So that difference is the area of our pie piece. r of t is just the position of the planet at time t. Now imagine the planet is moving counterclockwise for delta t units of time. Its new position is r of t plus delta t. Then delta r is just the difference, where the planet is minus where the planet was. And here's our fact from the other video. The position cross with velocity is the same vector c at all times. These three radial vectors form a triangle, and it's a pretty good approximation to the pi piece. Now it's not perfect as is since the pi piece, it's got like a rounded crust and delta r is straight. But if you made your time interval smaller, then you wouldn't be able to tell that the crust is so rounded and it would start to look more and more like delta r. 
So I don't know how to get the exact area of the pi piece, what delta A exactly is, but I do know how to get the area of a triangle if I know the vectors that form its sides. A triangle is just half of some parallelogram. Now given two vectors, you just copy paste them to make a parallelogram. And we know the area of this parallelogram is the magnitude of the cross product of u with v. So to get the area of a triangle, we'll find the area of the corresponding parallelogram and cut it in half. So in our case, we're just going to pick two sides of the triangle, find their cross product, find the magnitude of the cross product, and cut it in half. And we've got the area of the triangle. I've chosen the two sides r and delta r. We're trying to talk about a rate of change, so let's divide both sides by the change in time. 1 over delta t is a positive number, so we can move inside the magnitude. Just be careful though, it doesn't distribute to both r and delta r. We're multiplying. It's like scalar multiplication interacting with the cross product. It's like a times b times c. You don't distribute the a, you pick one of the factors to put a on. You'll see the smart choice is to put 1 over delta t on the delta r. On the left side, we've got an expression for the average rate of change in the area over delta t units of time. What we're going to do is we're going to take the limit as delta t goes to zero. And remember that that is the instantaneous rate of change in the area over time. Okay, but now what do we do with the right side? This is where continuity is important. You've probably heard a function's continuous if you never have to pick up your pencil while you draw its graph. The way you should think about continuity is that you can move a limit inside the function to the inputs. So the length or magnitude function is continuous, the cross product's continuous, so we can move this limit all the way inside and put it on delta r over delta t. The limit on the right is just the average velocity as the time interval gets smaller. So that should be the instantaneous velocity. On the left, we have the instantaneous rate of change in the area with respect to time. But now think about what we did in the other video. What I said earlier would be important. I know that this cross product is constant. It's always the same vector c. And if we zoom out and think about what we have, we've got that the instantaneous change in the area with respect to time is always this value, 1 half magnitude of c. This says that the area is increasing by the same amount at all times. Therefore, the change in area is going to be the same over any fixed time interval. And that, my friends, says each pi piece has the same area. Hope you found this proof as cool as I did, and thanks for watching. Hey, I'm back. You might be wondering, man, what about Kepler's first law? Does that have a cool proof? And the answer is, yeah, it sure does. And so I'll probably make that someday. Until then, consider liking, subscribing. Wait a minute, smash the like. That had some riz to it. All right, for real, bye.